much, Eddie. Um, welcome, Paul. Uh, Lieutenant Paul Murphy is going to give us a talk today on um, soldiers and sports people in the Defence Forces of Ireland. So this uh, talk is happening in the context of an exhibition called The Bloods by photographer Amelia Steen, which is running until the 11th of October. And we're very happy to welcome you to the St. Canice's Credit Union Learning Centre here at Butler Gallery for the third in a series of four talks by the Irish Defence Forces exploring different uh, roles and, and the history of the Defence Forces. And I think this is a particularly interesting talk because for me it was surprising how much uh, sporting life there is in the military. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to that. So I just ask you to obviously turn the mobile phones uh, on silent. Um, and just to say welcome to our audience uh, on YouTube as well, because this is a live streamed event. Okay, thank you. I'll hand over Thanks to very you, much, Holly. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is, as Holly said, uh, the third in a series of talks given by the, the Defence Forces and the 3rd Infantry Battalion. Um, this one is called Soldiers and Sports People. Um, two previous talks given by colleagues, Commandant Larry Scallon, uh, Captain uh, Margaret Hogan, and also Lieutenant Roisin O'Driscoll. Um, the fourth of these talks, uh, in conjunction with Amelia Steen's um, exhibition of the Bloods will be given on October 8th and it will be a history of the Defence for of the military archives from 1924 uh, up until the present day. So I suppose something a small bit different is soldiers and sports people. Um, as I was discussing with some people in, in research for this, um, for this talk, many people didn't know about I suppose famous sports people who maybe served in the military over the years or likewise military personnel who are actually quite accomplished sports people. Um, and so we'll look at that. We'll also look at the important role that sports plays in the development of uh, potentially soldiers for militaries and the qualities that, and attributes that soldiers and both sports people um, share. But I suppose foremost we'll be looking at um, the, the accomplishments of some of the greatest sports people that have served not uh, just in the Defence Forces um, and have had great success in the sporting arena across a wide variety of sports. Um, we can only select a few of them. We've had so many. We've selected a few, one maybe from a few different kinds of sports to show the wide variety. Um, I suppose as a small disclaimer for people who don't know about the military or maybe are aware of the military, uh, I'm an infantry officer uh, in James Stevens Barracks and what we often say to the military is that uh, infantry officers and technology don't go well together. So a dangerous combination is for an infantry officer actually to have a clicker in his hand. So in the event that anything does happen and my name being Murphy, Murphy's Law may apply to this. There are fire exits in the room, so don't be afraid if anything does go wrong. Um, I think in a, apologies, as we see straight away, in a proper way to start, um, you know, when you talk about sports people and military personnel, um, the barracks at the top of the town is called James Stevens Barracks. Um, our barracks throughout the country have been named about very renowned people through Irish history, obviously Collins Barracks, both in Dublin and in Cork. We have McKee Barracks in Dublin, as Commandant Larry Scallon alluded to in his talk. Um, our barracks is James Stevens Barracks. And of course, James Stevens is remembered significantly in Kilkenny um, because he was born in Black Mill Street. Uh, but also, I think it's poignant that he is remembered not only by James Stevens Barracks, but also by James Stevens GAA Club. So in the context that we're talking about sports people and the military, um, I think it's only apt that we mention James Stevens, and it's, it's a good starting point, and also ties in nicely with uh, Amelia Steen's exhibition of the Bloods. Um, I joined the Defence Forces, as you can see, quite fresh-faced here in 2008, and this is um, a picture from when I deployed to Chad in, in late 2009, early 2010. And just in preparation for this talk, I was looking back through photographs. And this photograph came up to me, which was just, I suppose, taken at the time and in no way was staged. It was just a picture of a few members of, of, of my platoon that was in Chad. And what, pointed, what stood out to me when I look back now is the prominence and the role that sport played uh, in the formation of people who were around me every day within the army. At this stage, I'm 20 years of, uh, of age, coming off the back of winning an under-21 All-Ireland with Kilkenny. The man to the front, which I'm still friends with all these people to today, the man to the front is Sean Fleming, who is now a sergeant in the Defence Forces and was a prominent water footballer at the time. To the rear we have Corporal Michael Comerford, who was a section commander, uh, who was capped for the Irish uh, military soccer team and also played League of Ireland. Shortly after returning from overseas, uh, Corporal Ray Cody was centre-back for the Kenny Intermediate team, who won in All-Ireland. 
And I suppose many people who may know sport will know uh, Lieutenant, as he was at the time, Stephen Malumphy, who is now a commandant in the army and captained Watford uh, for many years uh, following this. So just looking back on this, it was very prominent to me that sport played a prominent role in the development of soldiers um, that tr surrounded me throughout my career. When we look at just some of the attributes of soldiers, um, many of them transfer straight across, and these are only a few, it's probably a non-exhaustive list, that many of these transfer across into sports life. When we look at motivation, um, obviously motivation probably jumps to mind more so for sport, but you have to be a motivated soldier. Um, as you can see here, the soldiers on the, on the, on the right in the Glen of Amal, you know, it's, it's very easy to be, I suppose, a soldier when you're standing in Butler Gallery giving a presentation, but it's, it's not easy to be a soldier when it's three o'clock in the morning in the Wicklow Mountains and it's raining and you, you maybe haven't eaten in a few hours. So motivation is very important for, um, for soldiers. What is your motivation for being a soldier? Determination, again, you have to be very determined in your goals. Determination for sport and both the military and uh, sport develop your determination. Your ability to work under pressure is, is, is probably the most crucial one, really, that sport can teach you that is, is, is applicable to um, military life. You know, in military life, um, you're, most often you're going to be, I suppose, overseas, faced with very tough decisions, and your ability to work under pressure and the decisions you make, you know, in the sporting arena, that's something that can be developed. Um, how, do you, how do you react when there's 80,000 people looking at you and you have to make a decision, be it a player to go for a goal or a pointer? You know, how do you work under pressure when you are under pressure? Because it's not e an easy thing to do. Your leadership within the Defence Forces and within military, we have um, a very obvious rank structure um, and it's, it's very clearly laid out, but also sporting teams and uh, individuals who are members of clubs. Um, you know, we have leadership structures there. Some people come out as, I suppose, charismatic leaders. Some people come out um, naturally as leaders and some are developed along the way. But leadership is something that's very important, certainly within the military, but definitely within sport. Um, discipline is something that, from researching uh, this topic and talking to people who have been in the military, discipline was one of the biggest things that the military taught them. Um, in preparation for this talk, I met with Michael Carruth, who we'll talk about later on, and he said one of the biggest things that prepared him for a life in boxing was the discipline that the Defence Forces gave him. That it taught him to, that essentially you look out for yourself, you look out for your, the man beside you, the, the girl beside you, um, but you have the discipline to, I suppose, plan ahead to maybe, as a sporting person, decide, okay, maybe I'm not going to socialise as much or maybe I'll train that small bit harder to, to achieve my goals. And it's something that the Defence Forces certainly emphasises is discipline. Uh, communication, again, not just the words we speak, but our body language, our body language on a pitch, our body language overseas. Oftentimes, um, I have three trips overseas, uh, one to Chad and two to Lebanon. Oftentimes, there's a language barrier. Communication within the Defence Force is very important, more so in, I suppose, not just what we say, but um, our actions, really. And communication on, on, on a pitch uh, in the sporting arena is vitally important. Physical and mental fitness, I suppose they go without saying and they explain themselves, but, you know, you can be in the path to be physically fit. Um, mental fitness comes along the way because you're going to be challenged. You're going to be faced with digging deep. Whether it's as simple as going for a 10k run, or it's you're you're a member of of a team who's trying to play in maybe an All Ireland final or whatever it may be. Mentally, you develop along the way, and it creates mental fitness. And we, we know now more than ever the connection between physical fitness and mental fitness, and encouragement, I suppose, to be mentally fit as well as physically fit. And finally, one that is, I suppose, very important is resilience. Um, oftentimes on a, sport, uh, on a sports pitch, we all love to win, and it's probably what we got into sport for, but we don't always win, and we always get setbacks. Um, that's certainly something that is evident in the military. Um, recently, we just, I just returned from a trip with the 115th uh, Infantry Battalion to Lebanon. Um, we started out on what was going to be a six-month trip where we would return for three weeks in between at different stages. Um, to see our families, um, but as coronavirus kicked in, many of our soldiers didn't, um, didn't get their leave, and it was then extended by two months. So many of our soldiers spent eight months overseas um, not ha having seen their families. One of our, one of our soldiers, uh, who was due to return early to be home as his first child was being born, didn't get to return home. So we had to be very resilient in that matter. Um, in sports, some days you lose a match, the following morning you wake up, it can be very hard to decide, I have to go training tonight and you have to be resilient. You just have to pick yourself back up and go at it again. And it is something that I suppose all of us in life um, can't have enough of is resilience because uh, as you say, life comes at you very fast and resilience is something that we can use on hand uh, very regularly. 
it's, it's recognized internationally then um, through CISM, which is the acronym, which is translated as the International Military Sports Council. Um, so the International Military Sports Council, which was set up in 1948, recognizes that sport plays a vital role uh, in, in a soldier's life to improve combat readiness, skill, toughness, the development of physical qualities of the warfighter, and professional proficiency based on different areas of military action, land, sea, and air. So basically this recognizes within the CISM games, which we have World Games, which is held every couple of years, um, not just specifically military games, as we see on the left, we have different uh, types of duathlons, triathlons, pentathlons, different things which are very much military focused. But we also recognize the, the, the contribution that um, your everyday sports make, such as, as you can see on the right, soccer, basketball, volleyball, rugby, whatever the sport is. The International Military Sports Council recognizes that this plays a vital role in the development of soldiers. Something that it acknowledges is that, uh, you know, sport builds leaders who develop teams really out of habit or reflex. You know, within the, within the defense forces, within the military, you look to have people who are natural leaders, who just, I suppose, naturally grow into their position, grow into their rank. Um, if you have a boy or a girl who from a young age is a member of a team and for example we'll say a rugby team um, They're surrounded in an environment where they realize the importance of working together as a team the benefits of working as a team So in doing so naturally when they join a team such as a military environment out of habit or reflex they then um, have attributes that naturally develop teams and are, are positive for teams it also recognizes that um, sport nurtures pride which is a huge thing within the military that you're proud of where you're from you're proud of what you're doing the job you're doing um, I'm from a small parish just out the road which um, obviously very proud to be from I was born and raised there at Danes Fort and as I grew up I got to wear the club the club colors of Danes Fort and further as I went on I got to wear the county colors of Kilkenny and it's obviously with great pride you get to do that um, it nurtures your pride um, now as I'm an infantry officer in the defense forces you know I wear the badge of third infantry battalion on my arm which is the oldest infantry unit in the Defence Forces. It's based here at James Stevens Barracks in Kilkenny. Um, so sport, you know, instinctively nurtures pride and I suppose gives soldiers an idea of what it is to be proud of what you're doing and what you're part of. And I think obviously one of the main reasons also that CISM recognises this is that sport teaches leaders to be, um, I suppose, to think confidently, to think positively and clearly uh, in a pressurized situation. Again, it goes back to the ability to work under pressure, that if you are in a pressurized situation overseas, you may be faced with different circumstances where you have to think quickly. You're under pressure. There are people who are relying on the decision you're about to make. That's in, in a controlled environment such as sport. The decision you make on a pitch, whether it's you're on a rugby pitch, for example, and you decide we're going to kick for touch instead of going for a try or whatever it may be, people are relying on the decision you make and you have to make a confident decision, a positive decision, and I suppose have belief in the decision that, that, that you essentially commit to. Um, within the Defence Forces then we have the Sports Athletic Association, the Defence Forces Athletic Association. Underneath that banner um, falls all the sports within the Defence Forces. So as you can see, um, it's not just track and field as we would associate with the athletics. It's also soccer, um, judo, rugby and the Gaelic Athletic Association also falls into it. Um, again, the Defence Forces uh, has a place for everybody in terms of regardless your age, um, male or female, whatever sport it is you are into. You can see we have some of our veterans up here um, still participating in, in races internationally. Our women's soccer team have competed extremely well at an international level. So the Defence Forces itself recognises this. And then briefly we'll just look at, I suppose, worldwide before we come back to our own individual um, successful athletes. Uh, worldwide, some of the people that people may be surprised actually had military careers. Um, in the top left we look at Kelly Holmes who was a member of the British Army for approximately 10 years um, while being a successful track and field athlete. In the top right we have Jack Dempsey who was a multiple heavyweight champion of the world who served in World War II, was involved in the in invasion of Okinawa. Um, Joe DiMaggio down at, at, in the bottom corner, bottom right corner, uh, still has the longest serving hit streak for the New York Yankees and this was only broken when he decided to join the efforts in World War II, the American efforts in World War II. The record still stands to this day. Uh, in the bottom left corner then we have a man called Blair Paddy Main, who was captain for Ireland on five occasions I believe it was and also um, 
He was on the British and Irish lines, I, I believe it was in 1938, but he was one of the founding members of the British SAS. Um, but he was a renowned not only um, rugby player, but also a boxer, but is, I suppose, more notably known for being one of the founding members of the SAS. Uh, and finally, in the center, uh, someone we may be all familiar with is uh, Louis Zamperini, who was a great American Olympian, but famously in the film Unbroken, it documents um, his struggle during World War II after his plane uh, was downed over the Pacific and he spent 47 days adrift in the Pacific uh, before going to a prisoner of war camp. But the film touches on, I suppose, the, the, the fortitude he had, not only through sport and um, the lessons he learned through sport that served him well, both while adrift at sea for 47 days and also uh, when he eventually went into a prisoner of war camp before finally being freed later at the end of the war. And coming closer to home then, before we talk about our own Defence Force personnel, Harry Boland, seen on the right here, um, was the chairman of uh, Dublin GA in 1918. He hurled for Dublin in the 1908 All-Ireland Final, which they lost. Uh, and he was the referee of the 1914 Football All-Ireland Final on both occasions when it went to a replay, which Kerry won in the end. But, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very aware that in 1922 I would be wearing what is seen now as a Free State uniform, which Harry Boland may not have approved of. But uh, back in his early days, before the War of Independence, he was a very prominent member, as was the Gaelic Athletics Association, was a prominent movement at the time. And finally then, we have, just before we talk about our Defence Force personnel, um, it's great to bring it full circle in that we were here as part of the Bloods exhibition. And in 2015, Amelia Steen came as the resident photographer during Kilkenny Arts Week uh, to James Stevens Barracks. And also Mick O'Dea came as the resident artist. Uh, and during that time, uh, Mick painted this uh, painting of Michael Collins, seen on the left here, talking to the Kilkenny and Dublin hurlers before the 1921 or Leinster final, should I say. And Mick, uh, who has become a great friend of the barracks, as has Amelia, um, Mick painted this photograph, which was unveiled and is now on display in James Stevens Barracks. So it's great to be able to bring it full circle back to the reason we're here today for the Bloods exhibition. And I suppose to start it off, there's probably no better place to start than uh, the late great Dermot Early, who was a Lieutenant Ger General and Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces. Uh, Lieutenant General Early um, was born actually in Castlebar in Mayo, but he played football for Roscommon. He joined the Defence Forces uh, in 1965 as a cadet and was commissioned in 1967. Uh, he served in the Army Ranger Wing. He was one of the first members of the Army Ranger Wing, which is the, the special forces within the Defence Forces. Um, so to be able to juggle uh, a football, a Gaelic football career, uh, to win two All-Stars, five Connacht medals, um, recognises one of the greatest players never to win an All-Ireland medal, but to achieve both is, is, is an enormous achievement. He rose to Brigadier General in December 2003, before very quickly being made Major General in February 2004, before his final posting was Lieutenant General, which is the highest rank in the Defence Forces, in 2007, and being Chief of Staff. Um, I suppose... As we said at the start, we can talk about a lot of our sports players, but you know, in reality, it's a lot better if they talk for themselves, and I suppose they did a lot of their talking on the pitch. So we'll have a small clip of Dermot Early here and a few words of some of um, the people who knew him best. You are so glad you played the game that you had the opportunity to get to where you did in the game, and meet um, contest, uh, and put your skill against stuff like that. Anybody who was there in my time. Yeah. I to go to the to and and say, good to see you. You knew he meant it. Even Barbara also had the unique ability to lift you above what you could dream of being for yourself. When you were in Delta Valley's country, you were always in the sense of greatness. A man whose contribution to our life has been immense. Clearly, his peacekeeping role of the for the Irish nation. He had pride in everything on He was proud of his position in the Irish Defence Forces at all stages. It was wonderful to see him chief of staff at the end. Respected him all the I grew up learning about Gaelic football, particularly from the radio. We are here bringing you the game as vividly as, as you could possibly imagine. He was a great motivator, good leader, 
a great sportsman, a great ambassador for the game. Very belatedly, the 1970s turned with a kindly look towards Roscommon because they did win four Connacht titles, three of them in a row, in large part due to the inspiration of one of the great personalities of the 1970s, Dermot Ernie. <laughs> We looked up to him. He set the tone. The dressing room. He wasn't one of those guys who was rolling or shouting. But whatever he said, he said it honestly. And he was struck me with an honest guy and a guy who led us on the field and off the field. So that was just a small clip about Dermot Hurley. This is a picture that if anybody does, it's generally a picture that's used of Dermot Hurley, um, whether it be in a newspaper or, or otherwise. But for Defence Forces personnel, it, it's nearly a shame that they, this picture is actually cropped. The proper picture is actually this picture, which um, Defence Force personnel are very fond of because that's the way we, we remember Dermot Hurley. When, when you met Dermot Hurley, you got the feeling that he was genuinely delighted to meet you and interested in who you were talking or who he was talking to. As we said, he was a ranger. He's talking to a member of the Army Ranger Wing here. The way he's, he's described is that he was a soldier's soldier, in that he had been there, regardless if it was on a, a GA pitch, he was a member of the Army Ranger Wing. He had served as an advisor to the UN for four years in New York. If, if, if you could name it, Dermot Hurley has done it. And this was the way we remembered him. Um, unfortunately, uh, he passed away uh, at, at a young age in 2010. And his son, uh, Dermot Hurley Jr., is again a prominent Gaelic footballer with Kildare, uh, won two All-Stars himself. But the day, um, the day of Dermot Hurley Sr.'s funeral, uh, Kildare played Antrim that evening in Newbridge. And I suppose very famously his son, uh, Dermot Hurley Jr., who is a commandant in the Defence Forces now, uh, played that day in Newbridge, which was very, I suppose, a very poignant way of a tip of the hat towards his father. He captained uh, Kildare that day to a win, which is I, absolutely no, not an easy thing to do, I'm sure, on the day, but certainly something that I know Dermot Hurley Sr. would be very proud of, and I think a great way to a testimonial to Dermot Hurley Sr. Um, someone we move on to now is Kieran Fitzgerald. We think of captains of the Irish rugby teams, uh, now Peter Romani, obviously before him Rory Best. Um, you know, I suppose we think of people who are obviously on quite you know, big contracts, which is very well deserved and so on, but back in the, in, in the early 1980s, the captain of the Irish rugby team was a captain in the Defence Forces, which was Kieran Fitzgerald. Uh, Kieran Fitzgerald captained Ireland to uh, the Triple Crown in 82 and 85. He was captain of the Lions rugby team also, and captain of Ireland to the Five Nations as it was in 1983. But it's a remarkable achievement that a man who was serving in the military at the time uh, was captain of the British and Irish Lions and captain of the Irish rugby team. And again, I suppose we hear some of his, uh, his counterparts talking about him. He would use his experience and leadership, but he always led from the front. And that was his great project. On the field to play, Kieran was there first. Kieran was a great leader, really a great leader, and I mean, uh, coincidentally or not, Kieran was recalled to the Irish team both times when he went through a crown recently in 1982 and 1985. He was recalled having been dropped. Um, so he, and he had this magic thing, whatever it was, but he could, he could lead people on. Kieran Fitzgerald, and you're talking about great Pat. To share a dressing room with Fitz, and to listen to that guy, to, I mean, everyone goes like my version. Right, you know, this is the one that everybody saw the triple crown game in 85. But to, to share a pavilion with Fitz and to hear him exhort uh, every last ounce of energy that you had to give and commitment, and he looked in the eye and you knew by looking into his eyes that he meant everything he said and that what he said he was going to do on the field and then you responded accordingly. Um, so again, as you can hear, Kieran Fitzgerald, great leader. He went on also to be the, the aide de camp for Patrick Hillary, who was president of Ireland. 
and he later also went on to manage or be head coach of the Irish rugby team between the period, I believe, of 1990 to 93, and brought Ireland to the rugby quarterfinals in the, in the Rugby World Cup in 91. Um, someone at the moment who's currently still serving is, is Gemma O'Connor. Um, and as you, as you can certainly see from this, Gemma O'Connor is both obviously a great uh, Cork camogie player or hurler. She's representing, I suppose, our hurlers here in this as the most successful Defence Forces personnel to have played either hurling or camogie. Uh, Gemma has, I believe, nine All-Ireland medals and ten All-Stars. Um, she is also very successful. She's a sergeant currently serving in the Brigade Training Centre in Cork. I served overseas with, with Gemma on the 101st Battalion in Chad. And Gemma was also selected a few years ago to, uh, as I suppose a project taken up by both the Irish Army and the American Army, where they sent over some soldiers to America, I suppose to learn a few th things of how we train and how they operate, and I suppose just pit ourselves against you know, the American Army in the training environment. And Gemma was selected for this, and as you can see, I suppose a very formidable, formidable character, both on and off the pitch. Someone who probably has one of the most remarkable achievements um, is Commandant Sue Ramsbottom, who is now in the Defence Forces Training Centre. But Sue has an absolutely remarkable um, career, both in football and, as it turned out, rugby. Um, by the age of 20, Commandant Ramsbottom had played five All-Ireland Finals, um, playing her first at the age of 12 for her club team, the Heat. And she was, uh, I think still is, the youngest female All-Star uh, winning an all-star at the age of 14 on the, on the football team. Um, in her, when she eventually arrived to Galway, um, studying as part of the Defence Forces, she was looking for a way to keep fit uh, over the winter and found a local rugby team and played with them. But I suppose, as her standards are so high, she ended up talking out for the Irish rugby team on five occasions then, playing at full back. So without doubt, I suppose, Sue Ramsbottom, who's still currently a serving commandant, very high achiever and remarkable career. Went on to finish up with seven uh, All-Stars in the end and um, at Club All-Ireland also. She had uh, one All-Ireland with Leash in 2001. Uh, before we go to our very last athlete, we have, I suppose, family connections. And again, talking about...